already. Hello. Let us get launched with our live stream for today. We are doing uh, coding and I got some things to update here and there. So allow me to pursue those things. I got to edit the name of the thing. I forgot to do that before we went live. And it never remembers to uh, put it on a playlist. Don't mind me just fooling with stuff. And move OBS down so that I can see some of the controls. Adjusting all my windows around and everything. And uh, yeah, that ought to be acceptable. Hi. We're going to do a little plug in coding today, and I am pursuing more of my uh, down sampling folly. I'm not sure if I'd call it follies. Being able to make this stuff work at higher sample rates is pretty important. I might just as easily talk about my car repair follies, seeing as I'm um, taking the car into the shop again tomorrow, because now it's brakes and I kind of got to deal with that. I don't imagine that that's going to be a particular hindrance to other stuff that I'm doing, like the air windows oriented stuff. Hey, be music. Um, I will say it's distracting, and that's unfortunate, but you know that's life, whatever. So let's see. Let's jump right in. Boop. I also had something else to talk about, which I'm actually curious to what extent I can uh, do this or not. Um, I've been thinking very hard about starting up Evergreens again. And those who've been following me for a while know that Evergreens is something I was going to do based on analyzing the most uh, effective, successful hit records of basically all time, kind of in order of, of their general awesomeness and cultural effectiveness. Problem is, I started out with the White Album. You can't do that. There are a bunch of albums that people can put on YouTube and do things with. Uh, the White Album is not one of them. You cannot do analysis. You cannot play off of the original vinyl, the White Album. That is not a thing that can be done. They will knock your butt off of stream before you're even finished live streaming it. And so I came to a screeching halt, by which I mean I did about 30 or 40 versions of Evergreens as just completely private. Um, they turned into audio podcasts, and I still got them up. All the Patreon folks should have access to all of that stuff. And then I kind of stopped because going to that amount of work and not being able to communicate it to a larger audience is kind of a waste of time. It's not a total waste of time, but if you're trying to accomplish stuff, then you're missing the mark if you're not communicating to the larger audience. Oh, pitch! I have no way of doing a pitch shifting delay. Sorry about that. Not right now. I wouldn't say it was impossible, but I will say I don't have that going on right now. Uh, tape delay is going to be an initial start on whatever that is. Uh, 
it might be a building block because there's also a concept. I need to revisit Glitch Shifter because there's a variation on Glitch Shifter which corresponds. Maybe it'll just be a new version. Uh, there is a much simpler version of pitch shifting <coughs> that, <coughs> sorry, that was used in old samplers. And I could do that. But uh, what I've got in tape delay isn't as easily um, I don't think it's as easily associated with pitch shifting. Well, I mean, it's a bit, here's the deal, right? Delay and pitch shifting are not all that different, really. What delay is, is make a bunch of samples and then read off of the samples later. What pitch shifting is, is read off the samples at a different speed. So say you got your initial sound, and then your delay tab. And if you're going yay fast through the samples, and then your delay tab goes twice as fast, that's one octave up. If your delay tab goes half as fast, that's one octave down. So in some ways it's not more complicated, but here's the thing. If you're doing one octave up, you're gonna catch up with the right head at which point, where do you go from there? Well, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't go into the future and do the samples that haven't been written yet. You haven't missed much, Bo. I'm just uh, saying hello to people. So the trick with doing the pitch shifting, and there are a number of ways of doing it, some of which are a lot more sophisticated, like uh, breaking stuff down into an FFT and then changing the bins that you're in. What I'm talking about and what Glitch Shifter does is just working off of the sample buffer. And what you do is you skip. So if you're catching up and you go like, okay, we're starting from one second ago and going up to present time by doing double speed, you go vroom, what you do then is you skip back to a second ago, and that's an enormous jump. It is a huge glitch, as it were. And zoop, zoop, zoop. So what do you do to not have it be a entire second of like time dislocation? Like you have no ability to be in time with other rhythmic things. There's an enormous break in the sound. Well, you can move a tinier amount. You could be like you jump back 100 milliseconds and then you're going at twice the uh, speed of the sample rate and catch up and you jump back 100 milliseconds over and over and over again. What you get then is something that sounds like a sort of busted ring modulator. It's a real grindy, nasty overtone and since you're just skipping back there's a big artifact every time you do that, and it's just a really gnarly sound. And this is what's in some of the old um, samplers. That's what they use for pitch shifting. Now, if you want to do it a little more sophisticated, what you might do is go, let's interpolate. So when we're zipping forward to the current moment and then skipping back 100 milliseconds will crossfade so that by the time you get up to the present instant, you have crossfaded to a previous sample that's maybe like 200 milliseconds back and moving up. And so there's never a harsh switch between the taps. So you're doing kind of two taps, but you're crossfading it. So essentially, as you go through that 100 milliseconds ago point, that's at full volume. And then as you keep going, speeding it up, or indeed slowing it down, you keep fading away from that point. Now, the downside of that is 
halfway between the positions, you're taking two different points in time and averaging them. Your technique of crossfading means that part of it gets blurred out. It's not a clean uh, sample playback. So it softens things, it makes it a lot fuzzier, and you still have the problem of if it's moving at a very high rate, that is going to give you um, better time resolution on your pitch shift, that it's going to be more accurately positioned as far as rhythmic elements are concerned relative to the rest of the mix and all. But when it's just like 100 milliseconds or maybe faster would be a better, then it's still going to make a note. Even if it's interpolated, even if it's smoothed, it's still going to make a note because you have this overwhelming uh, frequency that's coming through. So Glitch Shifter does this by doing that multiple positions and switching when it gets close to zero crossings. And the really primitive pitch shifters just switch. And other kinds of pitch shifters will do the interpolation in various ways. You could probably use a sine calculation to do that to some extent. But, uh, and it all is based on the concept of a delay. So the idea of pitch shifting delay, you know, in some ways that's not all that complicated. All you'd have to do is use your delay tap, but then you have a frequency modulation on it. And rather than having the consistent delay tap, it's just going, it's, it's chasing much faster. There's even ways of interpolating things where you can have that be a little less edgy, but doing it well is a much bigger problem. So I think that's going to be an issue for another day, but it's something that we could certainly dive into. I mean, for the, the best reason to do that is somebody is here asking for it, namely be music. And as much as I like doing things that I'm interested in, I do kind of respond to um, what people are looking to see happen, because I mean, why not? If I'm making plugins, for people to have, and there are people like literally here who are looking for a particular plugin to have. It's a win-win. It's like, absolutely, I can try to do that for you. So what order samples go through variables and do calculations? B Music, you've talked about that before and I've never understood what WSOLA means. W-S-O-L-A must stand for something. So yeah, spell that out. Meanwhile, as far as tape delay, let's dive into some of this stuff. This might also be my way of answering Bo's question. This is a weird way of doing it, but tape delay is old and needs to be updated. Because it's definitely very strange. Like the whole thing is being, is being done in a downscaled fixed point math. It's weird. Uh, oh, well, hang on. Let me look. Let me open up something else then. And you're not actually looking at this, so that's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll switch it over momentarily. Let's open up a really old version of channel that's hopefully going to be pretty simple. Up, oh, except for that's a VST. How do I get that there? Here's where we're at. So old channel. Been through quite a few of these. That's maybe not the best example because this is a uh, yeah, let's not use channel for that. That is an interleaved IAR. That's a bit unusual. I do those, but I don't think anybody else does. 
Let me try to find an IIR that's not that. I think I have one in Mackety. Mackety is very simple. Mackety is so simple that all the bits of it fit into a very small space on the screen. One of the re oh. Yep, we have IIRs here. Interesting. Okay, B Music, that's exactly what I was talking about. DOBAS, W S O L A. Um, I've never used that acronym for it, but that's what I was describing. So if you're doing a pitch shifter and you need to um, crossfade between two different points so that you don't have a nasty skip, what you're doing is you have a overlap when the two different ones are overlapping. And you're adding them together. I don't know where similarity enters into that, though. In a way, that's what I'm doing with Glitch Shifter, but I don't know where your world of it is. And also, let me quickly pick at this. Yep, okay, fair enough. So what we're looking at is Mackety. And this is all the code that Mackety is, apart from the uh, denormalization code, dithering to floating point. Don't mind me, I'm moving a mouse pad over. Need to get another mouse pad. This one's kind of old and I'm not into the design so much anymore. Um, Oh, except for hang on, hang on, hang on. No. This is everything that is inside Mackety. And these are biquad filters, which are a lot more complicated, but this that is a uh, IIR filter. Very simple one. In fact, if you want, you can leave out this bit. That is denormalization code. This is an IIR filter. So what's happening is we've defined IIR sample A somewhere else. It's not within this loop of well and sample frames are larger than zero. That's the buffer. That's what we're working with as far as um, processing buffer lengths of samples. We're going to get handed a little pile of samples this way. And we step through them along the lines of n sample frames. And minus minus means it's getting smaller. And then source p is getting incremented down here by in num channels. But IIR sample A, which you'll notice is the only thing that is not input sample as far as a sound sample is concerned. This was defined somewhere else. This was defined in uh, the H file. So when we say, how is it storing older sample values? We're storing it like this. We have this number that is IR sample A. So when we, the reason an IR sample, an IR filter works, this is not a FIR. It is a infinite impulse response filter rather than a finite impulse response filter. So this does not work like a reverb. This works like an interpolation. Let me explain what that means. If you're doing a reverb or a delay, like the tape delay we're going to be doing, you got to keep a long list of samples because you're going to be looking them up over and over again. 
if you're doing a IAR filter, you do not have to keep a long list of samples. In fact, you don't have to keep the old samples themselves. What you're doing is keeping the output of what that is. And this is being implemented as a high pass. Let's call it a low pass. This is the simplest form. So we have two things happening here. One, we've got this value that keeps sticking around. Now that's not a sample from before or a list of samples from before. That's the output. That's the output of the filter. Even if it was a high pass filter, it would still be kind of the same. It would be the output of the filter. And since we're doing it as a low pass filter for the purposes of fooling around with, it goes IR sample A equals itself multiplied by something. You might notice this is similar to a dry wet calculation. Think of it like that. Except for rather than being dry wet, it is new information coming in versus old information. So it acts like this. I'd better not hit save, otherwise it'd be a pain in the butt. And we can also show that as two things. So the first thing we're doing here is IR sample equals itself times old information. This is how much of itself we keep. And then the other one is adding to it, not replacing it with, but adding to it the new information times, again, new information. And what memory is going to access first doesn't have all that much to do with it. What we're talking about is we're moving one variable, which ends up being the output of everything. And we're moving it by what the new thing coming in is. So we never actually look up old samples. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking the new sample and say we go like this and this is a number right rather than zero this is like a peak it's a loud noise it's a loud sample and then as we keep going if we have um old information being 0 0.5 and new information being 0 0.5 they have to add up to one if they don't add up to one, then the IR filter isn't going to work the same way. If you have that 0 0.5, which ends up being a, as a low pass filter that darkens stuff, but not super intensely, you can still hear a lot there. Do you do another sample and let's say we add zero to it, like the new sample that coming in is silent? IR sample A is now this. We do another sample. Let's say the other sample is silent. IR sample is now this. And then it's this. And then it's this. And then it's this. And then it's, and then it's half of that and so on and so forth. See how with the uh, this variable that we're doing that we're adding the new information to, we added a loud uh, sample, a burst of noise. Because it's a infinite impulse response, we just keep kind of dividing it by something as it goes. 
So we're never actually taking it away entirely. It doesn't actually stop. It just keeps getting scaled back and we add more of the new stuff coming in. That's how it builds up its ability to turn into very bassy noises, or if you use it as a high pass, you can do what you want with it there. We're never actually referring to older samples. We're not keeping a list of older samples. What we're doing is, uh, well, you might be asking the wrong question, Bill. At some point, I'm gonna stop trying to explain this, but I'm basically watching to see whether you get what I'm laying down, because I'm trying to do that teaching process of explaining literally how the IIR thing works. I'd also point out that if you had a uh, this and then you kept on adding it, Your old information was that, and the new information is the same thing, and they are both adding up to one. Each of your new samples wind up becoming the same. That's if your new information is always this, it'll just stay. If it's very close, what'll happen is it'll kind of scale back, or if you were doing a smaller increment, you'll have a kind of fall off. This, the idea here is, IIR doesn't have to refer to older samples. It doesn't actually have them on tap, it's just, dividing thing. Okay, cool. We're done. So next thing, apart from, do not save that. Thank you. So combining two different length filter, well, infinite impulse response, the length of those is infinity. There is an infinite length. So I'm not sure what you mean by that. You got to explain a little better. Well, here we have tape delay, and I think that did have, we're definitely gonna need to recode this. I'll figure that out later. The, the DAW runs samples through the code in sequential order, depending upon how many uh, samples are in its buffer. When it's finished with that, it runs another buffer immediately afterwards. So your question still doesn't make sense. As far as what order it does it within the um, C code, that, that might be what you're asking. It's gonna go from top to bottom. Like this happens first, and then this stuff happens. If you move this to down here, it would change the way it worked because G count wouldn't have been incremented at the point that we start using it. So it's going top to bottom. As far as doing different IIR roll-offs, they'll just stack. You can combine them and they'll just stack. What you're essentially doing is, assuming you're doing them one after the other and applying them as you go, there'll be multiple pulls. That's what multiple pulls is, is do this and then do it again and then do it again. Now, if you're interleaving them or doing something weird with them, that's a whole other story. But on the whole, hmm. 
let me thinking about how this works. I'm going to have to stop thinking about this to answer questions or stop answering questions to think about this. Though it does look as if I'll be able to do it by the time the stream is done. Let's actually start doing some of the busy work. Not stereo, mono. It'll be nice to get this updated because this is definitely one of the older plugins. TPDL is the version name. So our new version name, TPDM. Good thing I haven't done lots of versions of the TPDF filter, otherwise I would have been uh, overlapping these identifiers. And that would not do. So this is an interesting way of doing this is definitely going to have to be rehacked. No question about that. I can probably do a fair bit of this differently, but uh, yeah, like I can do a dry wet. Um, in much the same way that the reverbs in things use it. That way, if we can boost it to a certain point and halfway, we have full volume for both. Okay, so if you're doing Two different IR filters and you're not doing them in series, you're not doing them one after another, but you're doing one and then you're doing another at a different frequency. And then you get, if you were summing as in averaging the result, you do not have multiple poles. What you have is a blend between the other two. And that's valid. That's something you absolutely can do. Capacitor does something like that. Uh, I think it does. Not sure if it does. Um, as if they're simple IIR filters, I'm not sure how much you actually stand to gain from that. But if you are simply doing the average of the two outputs, what you're going to get is a filter that is never steeper than the steepest of the two. The curve is going to be just sort of like the one line and then the other line, and then you draw a line between the two lines, and that's what it's going to be. And if you add yet another very fast IR filter, that just steepens it at the point that the other IR filter at comes in. Now, if they get summed and averaged in some kind of more complicated way, rather than just 0.5 for the one and 0.5 for the other, like if that's getting frequency modulated, then a whole other thing might start happening. It all depends. I feel that first thing I need to do here is actually copy this over to start hacking on it later.
Okay, well that might be worth looking into. I am curious enough now that I'm going to take a moment and peek. Wikipedia probably has something on that. Or oh, it's a crap load of financial folks talking about it. Ah, AlanHull.com. So the guy that did this is actually writing a little paper on it. Yep, so basically all he's talking about is FIR filters if you're talking about actual moving averages. And I'm, I'm looking at that page now. You, commercial plugins, you got to reverse engineer them based on what you hear. So I'm now reading up, Bo, on what it is that you were looking at. I might be able to make better sense of it. I will note that we are not... What Hull is talking about is not IIR filters. That's not IIR filters. That's complicated averages, much like my average plugins. I'm going to drag this to my desktop so I can look into it later. Maybe we can look into this one next week. I can look into it a little bit and we can see whether we can make a filter plugin of this. So there are formulas for some kind of stock market nonsense going on. And, uh, but that's just basically another programming language for principles that we're already familiar with. Also, Hull's way of doing this is having the largest numbers be the most current, which is backwards from how I would be doing it. So what he's doing is... Um, having two different, uh, and remember averages also have funny characteristics as far as tone quality is concerned. You get a weird uh, nonlinearity, a, a weird dip in the response curve. As your rectangular average starts expanding outwards, it starts acting weird. And that's gonna be happening with whole stuff.
So what Hull says in the page I'm looking at is to remove the lag, we take the midpoint of 7 and add the difference between the two averages. So what he's doing essentially is, uh, some of this stuff is going to be changed around anyway, so I'll just use it as a scratch pad. So he's doing two different things, one that's a short average, one that's a long average. He is taking this. that, uh, let's see now, um, so basically him doing this this way means that all of the averages, all the filters have to be slower because what he's doing is adding an additional uh, high frequency enhancing factor that's not actually realistic. So that becomes like a, a wave shaping thing, honestly. Uh, so remove the lag by, take the midpoint, add the difference between the two averages. Actually, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got this backwards. So we are beginning with That's it, I think. He is taking short average, which is a smaller section, and adding the difference, meaning the uh, shorter section minus the longer one. And that gives a uh, something of an overcompensation, but uh, you know, I want to try this one. This could be fun. Tape delay was looking like a, a pain in the butt. Want to want to make one of these? Oh, I don't see where a long average times two would enter into it. That's not what he's talking about. So he's doing curve smoothing, but. Uh, And then he's using the square root of the period instead of the actual period. Well, that's interesting. The hell. Oh, Bo's excited. Oh, what would I recommend to mix soft drums with continuous long symbols? I have no idea what you mean. Like, what's wrong with soft drums combined with continuous long cymbals? Why would you need a plug-in at all? Isn't that fine? If it's not fine, explain what needs to change about it, and I'll tell you what would, what you would do. And, Bo, one thing about this is that this is not necessarily great phase response. Uh, 
this is something else. This is a depiction which is, it's supposedly, like this is, this is interesting. Also, we, you can't necessarily know that that's a plot. He might have just been drawing that, which would be sketchy, but financial people are sketchy. So the question becomes, like, what does using the square root of the period mean? Yeah, well, do the symbols sound smooth, Lorenzo? If the symbols don't sound smooth, in what way do they not sound smooth? Define smooth. Do they need to be all the same volume? Is that what smooth is? Or is it overtones or something? Uh, Jazz, we've done this before. Holt was a similar concept. And done, 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 done. We're doing this. We are doing this. Quickly give it a build. So define smooth. What is smooth in symbols? Is it quiet? Is it dark and, and bassy? Are they crackly? Do they have nasty overtones? There's a whole bunch of things to do, but I can't. I I don't know what you mean, unfortunately. So, you got to keep working on that one. Like, what does that mean? Meanwhile, So it looks a little bit, uh, Bo, like three different averages. Let me scroll this down. I see, I see. So. So this is two levels of, um, yeah, because the smaller one, I'm beginning to see where he was at with this. And then, let's see. Uh, he 
yeah, this WMA, basically that's just more av averaging filters. So we need three, no, we need two um, averaging filter sources, but one of them's being used twice. Yeah, I also have the acceleration plugin, Lorenzo. You might want to try running that on symbols if you would like to uh, control and manage them in a way that's not overly aggressive and doesn't darken them too much. It's possible acceleration would be even better than using a deesser for that purpose. It's a smoother uh, algorithm. So essentially, when Hull says, pity I can't copy from the other computer. I'm <laughs> on oh, two different computers here. Um, Uh, no plans to make a granulizer. That's not to say it's impossible. I just have no plans for it. So it confused me a little bit talking about the weighted moving averages because the thing is that... Um, This is not really like combining the two averages. It's behaving as if the um, short average is the main one. I think it might be a good idea to firstly change this. Our title is now Air Windows Coding Hull, because that's what we ended up doing. <laughs> so now let's open up some other things and dig out useful things that we can use, like averaging filters. After all, this is based on averaging filters that could be implemented like this, although boy, could they be a very different size than that. Um, let's take some of these and start putting them into hull. And of course it needs a identity. That was easy. My window is open beneath your chat. I shall move them over. That stuff can all stay the same. Might update this to long double land.
now that we've got that, I'm not at all sure that we want to stick with that. Um, well, the nice thing about a granulizer is that it could come out of other things as well, like uh, do the base work on it and another day might produce one like that. Slowly we progress. Hey, Pariska. Yeah, Bo, you're getting mixed up. The square root is only representing how long the average filter is. And we kind of need to expand the whole scale of all this, although that is awkward. I got to figure out how awkward all this is. Mm. Well, by the way, now that we've got like an hour in, I wanted to demonstrate something now that there's actually 17 people watching. Check this out. I've been buying CDs and as you know you get CDs and stuff and for instance if they are recent CDs like I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this one before that is a band called Transatlantic Progressive Rock Folks. And it is an album called Sempty. And this is what you'd expect, right? When you have a, a commercially made CD. This is called The Loudness War. I can play this. I love the music on this album. I can play it in the car. And it's really annoying because it makes my speakers like distort and everything sounds congested and unpleasant. I want you to see something. You can see that this is a album, an album that I bought. I have this CD. Yep. Yeah, th this is empty. Let me show you something. Ever heard of Depeche Mode? This is the commercial CD of Depeche Mode's Violator album. Let's see what else we got here. Here's their hit song, Your Own Personal Jesus. Look at that, look at that waveform. Same deal. None of these samples are reaching zero dB. Here's the sample that reaches zero dB. It's in the middle of this song. A hell of a good song. Very 
that's the song that has a peak that hits 0 dB. I'll show you what it looks like. See that? The spike up there? It's a bass transient. Looking pretty normal, huh? Here's another song. Here's a little quiet bit. Then it gets louder again. This is the album where a bunch of electronic musicians were like, I give up. This is better than anything in the world. I can't do as good as this. Is this incredible? And uh, this is what it looks like as waveforms. You know, crank it up and damn. If you try to listen to that off of Spotify or something, it's not going to sound like that. This is the store bought CD from like the 80s and 90s and stuff. It's an old, old CD. You can just look at what we have here and it tells the whole story. Here's another story. You ever heard of Yazoo? Oh yeah, I'm making flax out of my CDs. I bought the CDs and I've made flax out of them. They're lossless. Here is Yazoo, also known as Yaz in the US. Upstairs at Eric's, classic, classic electronic album. Did you get a load of that? This is not an obscure record. This record was a big deal. Nothing in it is louder than like minus 2 dB down. We can even normalize it. Making the hottest sample. It'll affect the tone of it very slightly because I didn't change it to 24 bit first, but it won't really matter. The amount of dynamics and uh, energy in the sound, as you can see, we can normalize it so the hottest sample is literally zero, it's literally clipping, and there's still loads of space in here. And once it, when it's finished, I'm going to let you hear bits of it. If I can identify tracks, which these are not necessarily, there's a whole bunch of albums that I have seen where people are doing reacts to, well, we do have meters here, so let's have a look. Uh, here's one of their hit songs. You can see most of the LUFS is under minus 12. I can also measure it. Here's another track. You can see the meters, I believe. Another track. I think this was their American head. I mean, notice where how the the snare jumps out and stuff. Yeah, it's these guys. Or a guy and a girl, it's uh, Vince Clark, originally from Depeche Mode, and Alice in Moyen. This is just a weird thing that they did. This was on the album. That's just them being weird. C 
see how quiet this is? Let me... Yeah, you can still basically see. Another track? It's a, a more B-side track. Here's one of their bigger hits. No, this is after I normalized the album. The, the louder voices. I'll show you what that song is. I like it a lot. Second to last song. This is Yazoo Winter Kills. Notice how it gets a little bigger in some places? Check this out. The intensity is going up. The, vo the voice is not compressed. Kind of builds to the end here. And then our last song is this. This one starts out with a loud uh, snare. Very clean. Actually, I think maybe there was another one that started with a loud snare. See what it's doing on the meters. There's one in particular where the snare came in loud as hell. And it's not this one. This one's called In My Room. Yeah, listen to how loud that snare is. Look at where that stuff balances relative to the snare.
that's what I wanted to show you before we get back into uh, Hull and all. I've been buying old CDs, and as much as I love the old records, it's fascinating to see what happens when you look at some of the, you know, th this is like old 16-bit digital. There's nothing that great about, like, it, it lacks a lot as far as really holding what the music is, but some of those old 80s and so on CDs did in fact do a really good job on the dynamic range. And you compare it with modern digital releases, I need to start doing those evergreen things. I would be able to do that with, and I'd like to get more in the way of measurement and metering and stuff online first, but That's something I really want to do, is get back into the evergreens thing. In pretty much that way, using records where I've seen React people play them all the way through and then talk about them afterwards. Because what, what went wrong was, I wanted to do that, but I tried to choose the Beatles White Album first, and that will never work. They won't let you, but a bunch of other folks will including a bunch of the progressive rock folks that I like best. So it's like, and that's the thing, is I need to be able to show you in the context of modern day production and what that does, and then just what it looks like and sounds like, ideally played straight through the stream of this old school production that's actually good. Because this is all totally doable. Like here, we'll open up the Depeche Mode again. Ideally, I also have it so I'm, rather than playing it over speakers, playing it literally through to the video and choosing stuff where they will let me do that. Because some bands will and some bands won't. And you can go by other people's uh, React streams to tell. And you can do something like this. You can see the meter over here. And I need to be able to explain things like, you know, here is this. Some of those percussive noises are little zwippy kind of, they're kind of like Zox boxes or 303s. There's a chirp from high frequency to low frequency. The, the percussion there is like a, an 808 style cowbell, which is just two little... Um, resonant filters that are happening at different frequencies. It's basically two little percussive notes going dee -dee 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 -dee. You can hear it kind of going dee -dee 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 -dee. And this entire song And I think that's the Yep. That's a different song. Oh, also note the intro, you might recognize the intro. Or not. Look at how quiet that is. That bing bing is Twenty dB down from full scale. In the modern day, nobody would allow you to do that, which is wrong. You should do that. And the entire song, a hit song, 
This is the CD that went out when they were putting CDs out and playing this on the radio and all that kind of stuff. This was very much still a thing. This is what it was when this was a hit record. Off the CD that was, tip, that was being used, and this is not significantly different from the record that came out. And the peak amplitude is uh, minus 1.62 dB down or minus 1.12 dB down, period, over the entire song. None of the samples clip. None of the samples are limited. The maximum RMS is always lower than minus 13.68 or 14 or so. Average RMS is closer to 18 dB down. I think I have LS, uh, LUFS, but if this was LUFS, it'd be 19 dB down. This is stuff to learn from. This is back when they were filling up stadiums. This literally filled up stadiums for Depeche Mode. They sold kajillions of copies of this and people left their homes and went out and watched them in concert because they were that thrilled by what they heard here. And this is what it was. No mastering for loudness here. Here's that bit in the middle of the song. That's what the waveform looks like. On a hit record that drove people to go out and go to these folks' as concerts, they were filling up stadiums. They were the biggest electronic act out there. Off of this. I could say this is how it's done. Yeah. Note the lack of limiting. Note the lack of clipping. This is what that was. People don't get that anymore. It's, it's just not understood. Here, this is a louder bit. That's a bass hit. Bass hit gets kind of loud. Not totally loud, but that's about as loud as it got. Note the lack of flat top. None of that's flat topped anywhere. Not even a hint of it. And of course, it's like uh, 2 dB down total or so. What that loud bit sounded like in the wild was this. It was the, uh, the downbeat on that bit. Oh, no, 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 no. This is not the digital remaster. This is the original one. I'm not that interested in comparing it against the digital remaster because we know what that's going to be. That's going to be more like this. This being empty. This being a very good song. And you can see how that's done. You can see what we have here. The digital remaster is going to look a lot like this. It's going to be this sort of thing. Well, I mean, playback systems has nothing to do with it. By the way, that sounded like this.
music is all fine, but it's mangled, it's destroyed. So yeah. And playback systems have nothing to do with it. What I showed you in Violator and Upstairs with Eric's will sound better on anything. Anything. Especially modern playback systems that can go louder than they used to be. Or modern playback systems based on Class B amplification, which is more tube sounding than they used to be. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned here. But yeah, I just wanted to show you that. Kind of wasted a little bit of time doing it, but hey, no matter. Let us start trying to throw together a hole. Firstly, by, uh, let's see now, by cloning it. Now, let's just grab all that and go. A lot of this is going to be changed a bunch, but for now. Let's see, one and two. We're not going to be using. Actually, that would have been fine. Didn't even need to comment it up. That is being replaced. This is going to be the same. That is being replaced. Might have done better to take the other average plugin, but whatever. That we don't need. That we don't need. That's really primitive, but fine. It's primitive, but it does kind of make sense a little bit. Um, those we don't need. This we don't need. That's a redefined thing that will cause us problems if we don't fix it. This I usually like to keep at the same word length. Come to think of it, so would this have to be Trying to get it so that at least it'll run. Um, bunch of this probably will need to be redesigned. I could be doing this in the loop and it would be easier. Probably need to look into the other later average.
So for darkening it, this would actually work. And therefore we have one thing and we're applying it every single time. Maybe it would be a good idea to dive into our more recent average. I feel like this is so primitive that it's on the verge of being kind of brain damaged and I don't like it. I must have gone in Aver matrix. I must have gone in and made some of it a little less insane over the... Yeah, it's a little trickier to look at, but... <laughs> that does actually uh, work. Some of this stuff is being able to do partial averaging. Like the way that my average works, it's not a hard transition between two different points. Instead, you wind up getting an average with a little tail end, which gets louder and louder until it becomes an additional tap. So much like the uh, bit crushers that I do, it is a analog style one. It kind of lets you do two and a half bits or or one and a third bins of averaging. Bins isn't really the right word, but whatever. So let's have a look at some of this. Let's... Oh no, that's defining it. Um, mind you, that still might be okay. Um, I'm going to really lose my words here. I'm going to really lose my words because i got to figure this stuff out. And it's all sitting around in the right brain, and so I lose language. Um, this is what I did here. Rather than do this. So let's steal it. That becomes that. And I think that will do exactly the same as the previous one did, but it's smaller and tidier. Quickly build it to see whether I even have all the variables I need. Nope. Some of this is pretty straightforward, though. However, I need to go and get overall tabs from this other thing. So let's see, this was an unused variable, so we can replace this with what that is and see if we can make it build. Is it busted? Kind of. Oh, goodness. Yeah, that's not the right word at all. Okay, that builds and that probably works. And so let's see whether we can get the other stuff out of every matrix, but simplify it. Because essentially we're not wanting to do it exactly the way this is. Overall polls we're going to ignore. I can't be thinking about your concern there, Jess.
Same with that. Well, the trouble with B music is that on like an Apple II, that would be significant. And in modern processors, um, it's not actually gonna save anything. They're so set up to be able to do these loops and things that sometimes you gain rather than lose. So let's grab a big chunk of this. This is pretty much the whole thing. We'll stick it in here. And we will take away Y. Because we don't want these nested loops. Now my question becomes, oh, and I have to adjust this a little bit. Take that Y factor out again. See, there's the same thing as those. This is the, such a tight little loop. Oh, but breathed air too. Yep. There's no cure. Let's squish this up onto the other line. And let's re indent it. And then this is the stuff we're going to throw away because it was ugly and came from the previous one. And can we build or does it die? It dies because why partial wasn't included in this scope. Therefore, I better go and Look it back up again. <laughs> oh, hello. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, we don't even need this, do we? This was from when it had the Y factor. That's why it says Y. Yay. Nope, much simpler. This is as big as it is. Not only that, we never use previous poll because that's also part of the Y stuff. That's part of Aver matrix. So that can go um, heck off itself. Build succeeded a... All right, this is not what we're shooting for, but do we have a averager? We're going to find out. Do we have a average R? I think it's going to be this one, maybe. Uh, 
I'm not sure if I believe in this. I don't think it's doing what I wanted. What do we got here? A big pile of nothing and unuseful. And what do we got here that's not doing what I want? Well, we do have a dry wet. And that is living on prem two. So overall taps is supposed to be param one. Okay, so when we were on the other one, what did it say? Let me show you what I mean. Ah, there we go. So this has to go to 10, not be just uh, zero to one. However, that is easily enough fixed. If it had to go from one to 10, you can do it like this. Yep, that's an averager. So here's the thing though. I think we're gonna want a much bigger range. Let's expand it out hugely. By a factor of like 100. That stuff should adapt just fine. I just have to update. I have multiple windows open. Unhelpful. I just have to update down here. So did we now get a super average? Yep, that's a super average. It's a hundred samples of averaging rather than just a few. Still base there, but we're losing everything else. Although interestingly, it's not a very steep roll off, this. And that's probably because the onset of the averaging is such a steep point that you still end up hearing a lot of that information even when you have a really large number of averages that's just enhancing. Here's the deal. Now we gotta experiment with this some further. Get those out of my way. So short average, length x2, long average, length x, and then yet another one on the end of the first one. So Now let's move you down so that it's all kind of fitting into the right place. Overall taps, that's the numbers we want.
Ah, but it's not, it's not bow. What you're hearing is the edge of the roll-off. This is not a whole algorithm at all. Instead, what happens is if you were rolling off stuff using an average rather than like an IIR or something, what's going to happen is you're hearing like the edge of the big rectangle that is a big pile of samples. So what you're getting is this thing where it enhances the extremely low frequencies. But then as the filter kicks in, because it's an average filter, it has funny artifacts. And the point where you're hearing it sounding like a volume control is because the cutoff where it's really emphasizing stuff has gone down so low in frequency. Uh, I'm not even sure if I can explain it. I'm not going to worry about that right now. What I am going to do, however, is make a special version of all of these things. I think I'm going to have to scale this stuff individually. Um, okay, I'm trying to figure out whether I have to scale this at all. Because remember, we're doing three different kinds of average. <sighs> yeah, I think each of these averages are scaled to what the size is. So I kind of get it. I kind of get what this has to be. So long, short, and shortest, I think. That means we are going to consolidate some of this. And I want to make it smaller looking, just because. I'll leave some of that commenting there. What concerns me is this overall taps because I need to make it be specific to this and I haven't yet. Oh, hang on. Got an issue. That. <laughs> Having made the, uh, no more, 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 more issues. That. Now let's see what we got. Up, oh, that didn't work. And this is why. Bunch of this wasn't working when I tried it first. Now what have we got? There we go. Okay, so part of it sounding like a volume control was it was broken, it wasn't working. This is what it's supposed to be like. But you can still hear the issues around it. You can also hear the heaviness of the bass there. There we 
we go. Way to make progress. I'm not sure how long this is going to go, but I'm definitely not going to give up right away as soon as uh, 1 o'clock rolls around. We're going to keep hacking away at it for a while because it's starting to get into a zone where it makes sense. So I can be reusing overall taps each time. I don't have to have a special name for it because it doesn't exist beyond, or does it? Hello, overall taps. No, apparently there is not one. Ah, uh, but I see something useful I can do here. We don't need you. And just for lulls, I can collapse that onto one thing. And I probably should test it, seeing as this is the code I'm going to duplicate in order to make the whole thing work. Therefore, so do you still make the appropriate noises, sir? If you do, we are almost off and running, and it is not impossible that I'll have this immediately. Uh, what would white noise sound like? It would sound like white noise hit by a big old average. Yep. It lives. Now, we need three different ones of these. And I'll show you how I'm going to do it. Boop. Because we're going to reuse this. We're going to reuse overall taps and we're going to reuse this other stuff. And come to think of it, got another quick change to make. This is definitely kind of crude. I shouldn't be going this high, but whatever. We'll get it to work first. I mean, it is running on a really primitive old laptop, so. Doing it in a more sophisticated way is left as an exercise for the observer. Okay, now we have three. A, B, and C. 
So, are we reusing these each time? I think we probably are. And we probably also don't need that to be specific. Because it's going to be restarted each time. I know I'm doing this separately because I started this first and then I made another one and I'm counting this one down and then I'm counting the first one down. And when we're done, they're both up, oh, come to think of it. No, I can't do it that way. I was trying to figure out whether I could do float 64 taps equals overall taps equals, but that doesn't actually instantiate both of them. When we instantiate them in a row like that, it is um, float 64 taps comma overall taps, which doesn't necessarily assign them. So this is good enough. And just for fun, I will move those like that. And now, here's what we're going to do. We've got three of these now. And we don't need to redefine this stuff, but we do need to reassign it, which we are going to do. So these just start being reuses rather than redeclarations. And they count as reuses because we're definitely just starting them over again. I'm going to smoosh that into one line. Some people would hate me so badly for doing that. I don't care. And then let's see. Let's, let's first find out whether we can just stack them and whether it still works. And then shortest average. A little space in here, which we're going to use later. Uh, actually, not much reason to not code it the way it's meant to be. Go on ahead. Um, So, because remember, we need to do this, right? So I could just go ahead and stack them to make sure that they actually work. But that's not what we're going to end up doing. Here's the thing, we need to rename these things. So here's our first one. There's our second one. There's our third one. So this is FA. 
and this everything has to be changed to FB. Wow, that was hard. Gosh. Not much to do there. And then this needs to be FC. Ah, uh, Jazz, you're the one that wants me to do everything in floats, right? B. B. And that appears to be all the places that those arrays appear. C. Uh, this error and this is basically C. It's actually a C++ file, but I'm not using C++ features. X loud average. <laughs> All right, let's see if that works and does a thing. Uh, X limit, why you not do that? Um, hello, I do need to have those associated with something, don't I? Alrighty then. What do I have a capitalized? Kind of have a camel case. Instead of being X, we're going to be A to go along with the A here. Actually, I have an even better idea. A successive A at the end. And one more. Because these need to be different. It's going to matter. Up, oh, and we got to update it here too. So these are the A. These are the B. These are the C, and then I'll do a quick little build to see whether I missed anything. Like that. There's still going to be a problem. That is the problem, but the other stuff seems fine. And it's also shown up here. Okay, now they should be stacked, and it's not our final result, but we can at least test to make sure that it all works. An alien kitten again. And the 
this will be a steeper roll off than it was before if it worked. Sounds like it. Yep, that is triple averaging. As you can see, there's still a whole bunch of bass in here. But this is three poles of lots and lots of samples of averaging. Now, to do the hull. Here's where it all comes together. Both long and short are on the initial input sample. Shortest is on something else, but we can actually do that by applying um, Bye bye words. Um, That's how that worked. So we can apply that here. We don't even need to do anything in between. And then here's our shortest average to tidy that all up. And put sample is the output of this third one. And these, as you can see, are running in parallel. We're running this, we're producing the output result of long average, and then we're not using it until here. So this and this are running in parallel. This is the one that we're going to be listening to the output of, and we're actually subtracting that from this and going over here to do there. So, Next thing we do is apply this. You think all this stuff can piss off and go away for the moment? Goodbye. Um, long average length X. So overall taps is 99, and that is our longest one. Short average x divided by 2, which is the same as times 0 0.5. b is our short average. This is now going to be half as long. And then lastly, shortest average is square root of x. We already had in parentheses and everything. Note that we're not dividing the uh, basic level by, uh, we're not taking the whole thing and dividing it by 0 0.5 because we want to still add the one on the end to not be doing an average of half a sample. And now that we've done those things, Let's see what we got. Moment of truth, Bo. What did we make? It's kind of cool.
I don't think it needs this many samples. Oh, I'm liking the sound of that kick drum. It's got a real smack to it. Oh yeah. We got some noise going on. We got some peaking going on too. This is louder than... Here, let's hear it as a high pass. Same deal. It's a little weird, it's a high pass. Kind of got see though. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jess, I was asked for this, so. Let's make this. Well, I mean, the thing about it is that as the low pass, it retains this punch in the transients, which is very interesting and handy, which means that if you have it as the high pass, it's taking more of the punch out because that was what was, it's the inverse thing. So what I'm going to do is code up a quick wet uh, variation which I can do here. Oh wait, no reason to make this test. It always has to do this because I got to apply it, otherwise nothing would happen at all. Magic rapid copy and paste. Sometimes it's handy to do copy and paste. (laughs) 
So in theory, that should work, except for I do have to, yeah. I think that'll work. Let's find out. Here we are. Oh, except for that's not right. That's actually much louder for some reason. Why is it doing that? If what is larger than zero, this is all fine. If what is less than zero, one point zero plus a negative number should be making it smaller. Got to figure out what's making it do this. Yeah, we're just doing one or the other. What if I do this? Plus dry sample time, that should still work. Well, let's see what we got. Because there was something wrong with that. We now have like 6 dB. Now we are normal. shouldn't be happening. Why is this happening? Oh, hang on. Is it applying this first? I always like adding extra parentheses. Let's see if that helps here. Because we should be taking this and only then applying the multiplication. If it's doing that in a different order, that might be the answer. Actually, that would explain a lot, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that did it. Place your bets, place your bets. Did we just fix this?
is it a sequence of operations thing? Yup. That was a sequence of math operations thing. So this is now our plus, and this is now our minus. This is definitely, we're peaking a little hot here, as in more than a little hot. We can get peaks as much as like over 3 dB here, getting close to 4 dB, that's kind of a lot. And that also interferes with the high pass factor. It's not a perfect high pass anymore. Well, we have all these other controls, so let's use them. Let's find the magic number for scaling the whole thing down. Now that we've done that, we can dial in what is accurate for applying this to like lots of bass and stuff. Let's see what we got. And we'll dial it in by applying it on the high pass. Once we've successfully done that, the low pass will no longer be clipping. Here's our low pass, and it's going to clip lots once the other stuff kicks in at least. Dry, high pass. Interesting. find a place where it cleanly cancels out. Okay, so if we're using it as the high pass, it needs to actually be full scale. But if we're using it like this, it winds up overshooting. So what else can we do? Um, 
Well, we've still got our scale factor. It's just it needs to be a little more complicated. So if it was a factor of these things combined, then it would cancel out. And the question is, does it cancel out at all frequencies? For all settings. I'm pretty sure we are hearing that it has the tendency to overshoot. That's what it sounds like in audio. Something happened. Something happened. It's not what we wanted. What's wrong? What's wrong is that scale has to be one. If scale is zero, then everything is just silence. <laughs> hmm. I'm feeling skeptical of this whole scale business. Um, Let's invert that. Back into the breach. Well, I mean, the thing is, if we're calling this the Hull MA, we probably should make it do the thing that it does. So we're just adding a tweak to fiddle with it. Now, let's see what we got. We got silence for the full high pass. So far, so good. As far as... Also, so far, so good. So now, if we do the full high pass, no, that's still you know, whatever we wanted, it wasn't this. So what's going on? What's going on here is we can scale the overall thing, which changes it and stops it being Holt anymore. I mean, uh, whole anymore. And if we change that too much, we can no longer high pass the super high frequencies anymore. We could just make it an output trim. My concern is that with yeah, there's a problem. There's a variety of problems. I feel that doc doctoring it this way is not helpful. We can adjust everything based on shortest average, though, because this is where that gets applied.
I'm just staring at all these bits. We're kind of walking over both sides of this. Start here, count up, assign all of these. Start here, count down, and scale all these. We make sure this is not too far. We make sure this is not out of control. Both of those are sanity checks. I'm going to put them on the same line. I love doing stuff like that because people would hate it. Like, you must not have multiple things on the same line. You're obfuscating. I don't care. Uh, I'm going to put parentheses in there, not because we need them, but just to kind of distinguish a little bit. Could it be that we do actually not want this plus one here? Because that's making the small settings be larger. And then we're dividing by it, meaning also that if we have large settings, so square root whole setting times 99 plus 1, that's going to be the same increment each time. So small settings are going to be larger than they would otherwise be, but large settings are going to be. How do we scale this? It's going to be in here. This is where we can scale the output of the whole thing, although this is also a possible place where it could be happening. And I couldn't tell you how, I'm assuming that this is how we got to scale stuff. All the parameters seem to be about right. trying to get it so that shortest average when at a large setting we're still canceling out. And this is still fine. No special reason to do that, just doing it. Let's just fake it and see what we get. Whole thing could die, but not like that ever happens in these streams, right? We're gonna fake it to this, which is not how it's supposed to go and could have catastrophic bugs, but we're gonna see what happens. Come to think of it, we can also literally just go here.
Now what do we get? Uh, Drywood is picking between high pass and low pass versions. Oh, that didn't work. Do we not have scale in anymore? We don't have scale in anymore. Goodbye. Do we have blow up of the plugin? Does it now no longer work? Fairly straightforward to put back if it does. Well, it cancels out. That's definitely still loud. That's not helping. Okay, so there's a point of discontinuity here, although it still seems to function. I could probably work out what this point is. Weird, I can't get it perfectly zeroed out. It's not helping with my gain thing. I might as well put it back. So that should have given me back what I needed. Now what we've got to do is figure out how to fix it. After testing to make sure that I did actually get it back. Full dark, full bright. That's how it's supposed to be. tell the overshoot is to crank it up all the way. Sure, let me show you. Sounds kind of filter sweepy. Don't see why not.
we got a peak. And we got bumps. That is the shape of our new thing. Kind of like this. Well, our only control now is this. So Here's your bypass. Yep, this is what we get. Nobody ever said it was a clean filter. I think the interesting thing is not going to be this so much as let's look at it at some waveforms. Do not save that. Like, for instance, a sawtooth. Firstly, let's zoom in on the sawtooth and see what it says. There we go. That's the sawtooth. We have no way of looking at this other than to apply it, so we'll apply it. Makes a funny sort of little asymmetrical shape. See, we've got one rising edge sawtooth and one falling edge sawtooth. Let's also play with uh, other settings here. Yeah, like if we do this, we can see the overshoot. Here's our biggest overshoot. Oh, interesting. Check that out. So that's the new shape. That is what hole does to a sawtooth wave. Kind of cool. Gotta say, that could come in handy. It's different based on what direction it goes, but it's gonna follow it's going to follow the uh, steepest part by first slowing it, and it goes pretty directly into that. And then when it returns, it adds a kind of uh, a smooth bump on the edge. Let's try it at a even higher frequency and see what it does there. Just a bit up, oh, sure enough. So this is where our overshoot apparently comes from, is it keeps flying on and then catches back up, and that's what it does. I think we've also smoothed out the peak on the other side of that. Uh, that's interesting. Very serious reshaper of waveforms here. Let's just hint at the...
that's just a hint of interesting. So you see what this did? With just the tiniest amount of it, it is taking away those intersample peaks. Doing that rather cleanly. I think it's adding a couple of intermediate stages here, but pretty smooth interpolation there. Whereas if you don't have that, check that out. So we got a pretty uh, neat angle changer there, just in the edge of it taking effect. On the basis of that, I'm going to try getting a little more control over that. Seeing as it has interesting properties in the super high frequencies, and we're no longer worried about the overshoot, that's just part of what it does now. Like, don't run stuff that goes up to zero dB unless you want to handle it with something later. But, what we're learning from this is, using that sawtooth, And you can see the overshoot there. we can keep everything really, 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 really linear, but we're adding extra samples in between, so we're able to smooth off that intersample. But the rest of it is real, real flat. This is interesting to play with. I'm glad that I added that smoothing factor there. Let's try it on some drums at a higher sample rate. Might be worth scaling all of this, but uh, we'll see. That's something I can investigate later, I think. It's really good at isolating extreme highs. So this becomes you know I could revert it and have it become a bright dark. This would be dark, and this would be bright. What do you think? Let's do it. Now I'm going to leave it indicating wet because that's basically how it's being done. But
Mm. Yeah, but it has the capacity to be able to balance more brightness into it when turned up. So I feel like and and although it gets kind of peaky and overshoots, it's definitely having a darkening effect when you go lower than 50%. So And of course, this I have to do differently for the VST, but that's normal. That's trivial. Dry is in the middle. Neutral, in other words. And would you look at the size of that? It ends up being this big. It's very cute. I can see why programmers often like to do this, although they don't do it the same way I do it, but they like making it so it's like, there's my function and it has three words in it. Yay! Throw in a couple of notes just to represent what's going on. And let's build it and see if it's doing what we thought. Because we could have got there. That might this might be it. This might be what whole means. Bada bing. So there's our frequency. I probably need to adjust it for the sample rate, but I'm not absolutely sure because it's a like economic function. So there's our brightenizer. See, we're applying it at 96k and it's basically fine. Oh no, it's not the shortest ever. So we can boost stuff this way. Or we can darken it this way. Since we're running at a higher sample rate, we're not having as extreme of an effect, but it's still doing its thing. To make it cover a more extreme effect, we'd have to run the entire thing at a much larger range. And that gets messy. So we got a kind of high frequency control thing going on here where we're doing this. And then we can darken it in this pretty handy way. Almost a bit of a resonant peak there or something.
interesting. It's a messy algorithm, I gotta say. I gotta come up with a way of not having to just constantly increment every... The bucket brigade thing has to go. Seems like that is in the zone. Mm, I doubt it. I think this whole this whole guy has probably got um, enough going on with it where the thing he had in mind seems to basically work. So I'm a believer, I buy it. Let's see what it does at 192k. Is this going to become just ugly? How about the brightening? Definitely going to have to come up with a way of not bucket brigading it. That is the worst implementation. It, it's just not okay. But we do have something that makes a noise. those voices come off too. Yep, we're on to something. What remains is only a adjustment because check this out. Everything we're doing here can be done exactly the same in a different Im implementation. We are bucket brigading an entire pile of samples meaning we have to keep an entire pile of samples and then we're bucket brigading them only to go and put a new one in. And then we are starting at the beginning and at zero with a blank start off and adding every single one in the bucket brigade. All we have to do is what we do with the delay line, keep a really long pile of samples, add one, remove one. So we could be doing this with two operations, not 200. And if I code that up, then it will absolutely work for as wide, you know, it doesn't matter how wide it becomes, it's still gonna be like two, which also means I could have it be adjusting to sample rate so that it's picking the same frequency each time. It's just not doing that right now. And this is, although it's kind of amazing that this runs on an antique laptop without it heating up all that terribly much. That's kind of amazing. But yeah, everything that you're hearing, everything that I've done here, I could be doing it with like one add and one subtract 
on a continuing variable, much like with the IIR filters, rather than 200 ads for each pole of the filter. So it's like 600, you know, six or eight or so adds and subtracts versus 600 per sample. So yeah, there's some uh, optimizing that I can do between now and next Sunday. And I think that'll be a thing. I can, I can do that when I drop my car off to get its brakes fixed. And uh, with a bit of luck, that'll work out nicely. And then when, by the time I get the car back with actually good brakes again, um, I will have the uh, the optimizations that I need. This, this shouldn't be that hard. We shall see. So on that note, I'm going to call it a day. It ran an extra hour, but I think it was worth it. All that I'm really lacking is um, being able to scale it up to 192K if I want and dialing back that massive CPU hit of having to do so many calculations, even if they're very simple calculations. And yeah, yeah, the sweeping can sound nice and gritty. And I think it's a multi-purpose tool because the uh, low pass version of it has its qualities but the high pass version of it is going to have the inverse qualities which can be nice in its own right like we can you can use the high pass to just delicately soften uh frequencies i could also flip the position of the frequency so high frequencies would be all the way to the right um but yeah there's there's a variety of things that could be done won't necessarily look and act, but I think I've got, I think I got another two slider on my hands and I always like those. It's slightly unorthodox, but it's kind of like when I put out spiral or whatever is, it's meant to be kind of unorthodox and it's applying things in its own way. Guess I'll see you folks next week. Wish me luck in optimizing it because the <laughs> I'm like throwing up at the, how many cycles how many processes it has to do in order to do this when I know that it could be doing it in like a hundredth of the CPU. I'm, I just got to retain the same buffer that I'm retaining, but I don't have to shift everything. It doesn't have to be a bucket brigade. Bucket brigade is terrible. Past like incredibly tiny sizes. So, yeah. Let me see what I'm doing. So I will bid you guys uh, adieu for now, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.